Hi guys, I'm coming at you from Europe at this time. We got an unassuming Citroën service. Citroën is a French car, it means lemon. So right now we're at a, my friend's garage where he actually uh, collecting and fixing old cars. So if you see the uh, dealership down here, there's not much to look at, but if you start looking up on these windows up here, then you're gonna see uh, a bunch of nice cars. So actually he has a garage where to reach the garage, you need to take the elevator with the cars go up there so I'm gonna take you guys around and show you what he has so here is this unassuming door let's go look inside what we find inside this is my friend's man cave he has all kind of relics uh, these are the stuff that he collected throughout the years I'm gonna try my best to translate it he's saying uh, my name is uh, Tomasz Pastor and I started very early in my uh, life to uh, play with French cars here's a Citroen DS what I'm pushing around as a kid it was my hobby to look at catalogs which I got sometimes from the United States and just look at car parts my grandparents uh, they also had French cars and uh, they were uh, they had a garden and then they were selling uh, vegetables at the uh, market so my grandpa did some sort of three-wheeling uh, device but they were able to carry those things so a motorized three-wheeler but they were able to carry their produce to the market my parents had a 504 peugeot and then you can might be able to pick out the uh, 204 diesel combi peugeot what my grandparents had and then later on we graduated into the peugeot 604 there are so many things up here that uh, I asked Thomas just to uh, select a few things what he's uh, really proud of and uh, talk about it for us. He's saying let's go back to the beginning. So around 1991, he started as a young man uh, disassembling Citroëns, what he got from uh, Vienna and from Austria and from other places. And then uh, he was selling the parts uh, to other people who had these cars, but uh, there was no parts available in Hungary for Citroëns at that time. And then uh, later on, he was able to obtain a dealership license from Citroën and start selling them, uh, basically new, selling new parts in Hungary. And he had a f one of the first Citroën dealerships there. These are his cups, what he won in uh, several different races in Germany. And they only used mechanical uh, timers not digital timers so uh, the Germans in other uh, in other countries they really know him well uh, because he they, they won a lot of races there and they also went to so these are time endurance um, rallies for classic cars and I asked him to let's talk about a little bit of the Monte Carlo historical race and I have a vehicle which been there but uh, yeah not like this like uh, Tomas is taking the different car there almost every year so he, he participated in that uh, very demanding race quite a few times. You can see his uh, signs up here as a collection. And he also won uh, uh, several cups. Uh, here's a Renault Gordini, Renault 17 Gordini, what he uh, took there. And then they took this uh, Abarth uh, Fiat uh, as the latest one to the Monte Carlo rally. In the last race with the Abarth, he got uh, second in his category and uh, number 11th from uh, from uh, overall in the race. I was asking him about his display case. I see a lot of uh, small cars in there, so I was asking him, uh, what about these cars? He says, like, some of them he used to own, some of them he still owns, and some of them he'd really like to own in the future. So he's just displaying them in this case uh, to remind him uh, of, of these cars. I brought him a few little presents from Kentucky. First of all, a little bourbon, and then uh, Hemmings Motor News, since I know he likes to uh, look at catalogs. So when he was a child, that was his hobby. So here's a Hemmings Motor News, which he can look at cars that he might want to buy, but I don't think he can find anything over here what he likes. But uh, yeah, that was, his, that was his hobby when he was young, to look at catalogs. And then uh, a calendar from Napa. Thanks, Chuck. To, uh, to give it to his son. Now that we've seen his man cave, let's look at his uh, cars. So here's an unassuming saying it's a parking lot on the door. So when we open the door, um, here comes a very interesting uh, uh, kind of weird car, a Cadillac, and then a Fiat Spider, a Jaguar, and so many other things. This is the uh, storage part of the uh, operation. 
it's almost as overwhelming as the Lane Car Museum in Nashville. So I think I best just ask him to talk about these cars and then uh, tell us about each and one of them for us. He's saying we used to uh, repair only our own cars or own collections, but since 1999 we opened up the shop for others to bring their cars to us. So we got a really a solid customer base who brings their classic car for us for a regular service or or some uh, other work what needs to be completed. So some of these cars are actually customers' vehicles, what, what we basically store here. This first one is an original condition uh, Fiat 130. It actually has a V6 engine. It's, it's quite a large Fiat from all, and not too many uh, left uh, in original conditions like this. In Hungary, you not, will not be able to see them at all. But this car is basically a survival, and it's not a rebuilt car. It's the, this is the way it's uh, left. So it's almost like a, an American-sized car, but again, it is a Fiat made in Torino. So for Europe, a V6 engine is a huge engine because most of the cars are little four-cylinders. It has uh, beautiful chrome bumpers and everything left the way it was when it left the factory. This one is a customer car. Somebody brought it from Italy and then we still try to determine what would be cost effective to uh, how much to fix it up or just leave it the way it is or just mechanically repair it or something like that. Then there is an Alfa Romeo Giulia SS just waiting for a service to be completed on. It's a beautiful coupe, by the way. One of their returning customers owns this car, and then uh, Tomáš saying he, he repaired a lot of cars for him. And the next one is a very uh, iconic Peugeot. It's a Peugeot 404. Unfortunately, there was a storm and a tree fall on it, and then somehow it damaged the... Uh, the fender and then it used to have an original color original paint from the factory so now uh, they're gonna have to somehow match it and then uh, repair it this one is a Peugeot 505 Danja the Danja factory uh, was kind of started in the early 70s and they made modifications for the Peugeot factory this one is a 4x4 which they built for the forest service and other places Nowadays, it's really, really hard to find one, and it's an incredible amount of money. Like, I looked at the market, it's about 150 grand to buy one of these things. And then uh, it's, it has a, a differential lock and then a four-wheel drive. The original car was actually just a front-wheel drive, so that factory modified it to uh, be usable uh, in, a, in a really rigid environment. That same factory who modified this car they nowadays they making all kind of modifications for almost every other European manufacturer as well, so they can be a four wheel drive uh, setup. This car has a 2.5 liter turbo diesel engine, the XUT3 engine with an intercooler. He's saying it's 110 horsepower. It has a 2.5 liter engine. He's saying there was a really good find because it's almost impossible to actually find one and bring it out from France because everybody buys it. Someone puts it puts one up for sale and the next minute his phone is ringing and somebody buys it. So it was an incredible find to be able to uh, basically uh, rescue this car out of France. And then uh, it really needed uh, a lot of repair and then uh, they fixed it up. It took a while and then now it runs perfectly. When these were new, usually ended up uh, in the government, in the military or forest service or other places. And when they were done, they usually ended up in Africa. People came and bought them and then uh, they have their second or third life being uh, lived down in Africa because they, they're so durable and then they're really good in sand. As you see, there are a few American cars which are waiting for repair. But uh, you can see all these in the U.S. all day long, so it's uh, kind of out of place uh, to look at these cars in Hungary. And then here are some more uh, cars we're waiting for. Oh, this is a Russian Gigoli uh, with a classic plate on it, a Ferrari. And then here's this very yellow car. So I asked Tomáš to talk about this, like, what is that? He's saying this is a Lancia Fluvia 1.6 HF. So this is a race car version of uh, Lancia. So this is his own car, and they are preparing it right now for the next uh, Monte Carlo race. So he's saying, as soon as my time allows it, I'm going to continue work on it and prepare it for another Monte Carlo rally. 
He has other cars which he took to Monaco before, so this is the next one in the line uh, for that race. And as we going forward, so this was the uh, kind of the dusty garage, the, the storage unit, and now here's the actual real garage here. Yeah, you're gonna see some incredible cars here. I, I really like this place, goosebumps. I'm gonna ask Tomas to uh, talk about his cars, or some of the cars are actually customers' cars. This one is his. He's saying that this is a Peugeot. It actually came from the U.S. There was a time when Peugeot win the uh, taxi cab contract in New York, so they brought quite a few into New York. So this is a diesel, it's a 505, as you see, and with the American bumpers on it. It's a very different car compared to the European counterpart or European edition. It's, it's a fully equipped car, so every extra was put in it, what was available at that time with Peugeot. This car also uh, hasn't been restored. It was built in 1982 and has a 2.3 liter turbo diesel engine uh, made it to an automatic transmission it's uh, it's in an incredible condition and it's like a, like a diesel mercedes it's like runs off the end of the world i have a mercedes 240d and i call it my racing turtle so he's saying this is his racing turtle this is his friend's uh lancia fulvia 1.3 s uh, series 3 and this is a Monte Carlo edition. That's why it's a, those black, uh, the, the satin black paint job on the front and the back, they're original. This particular car was made by the end of the Fulvia line. So this is a late model and uh, he loves it. He participated in a lot of races with it and he's a Mercedes collector, but still loves this car a lot. This is uh, his uh, Ferrari 365 GT. 42 plus 2. It's actually a four passenger, like sort of a family Ferrari. He's saying it's a series one or actually series one and a half because it's got the four lights in the back, but also have a central wheel uh, not on it. He's saying he got it in uh, poor condition. They had to totally fix it up. And then uh, last year he didn't even use it. But before that, they actually uh, uh, went over to Italy with his family. So the two kids and them. Um, and with his wife, they, they went to Italy and then uh, they went to the Ferrari Museum. And after that, they had a really fun time. It was a reliable vehicle. And uh, he's saying it was, uh, it has a V12 engine with many carburetors and uh, it never let them down. It was it was working perfectly. It, uh, it was doing uh, 15 liters in 100 kilometers, what he's saying. It was at the same time when the Milla Mia race was held in Italy. So they went to uh, look at that. And after that, they did a really nice uh, uh, tour around Tuscany. So I was telling him that uh, I took my kids there as well uh, another summer. And then uh, we're looking around in Tuscany. And then uh, my kid says, well, daddy, it looks just like Kentucky, but it's all brown. <laughs> so that's it, for, that's it about Tuscany for us. This Mercedes belongs to one of his friends. It's a 107. I, I have a connection to a 107 because I have a 280 SI with a manual shifter with a six cylinder engine at home. This car is, has a, this car has a longer wheelbase and the roof is not removable like on mine. Mine has a hard top and a soft top. This one has a wiper for the uh, headlight. I have a lot of weird cars back in Kentucky, but none of them are French. This one is a French Renault, a Renault Gordini. Um, yeah, I, I know absolutely nothing about this car, but this uh, this was uh, one of Tomash's uh, race cars, which they went to uh, many different races. And those stickers on the side, they're not just basically something what you buy and put it put on, it's actually been to uh, all these places, what you see there. And it's a bona fide race car. Tomas is saying it's a 1972 1.7 Gordini. He had a 1.5 before and then uh, he really liked it, but uh, this one is more of a car, so he built this one to a race car. He's been to some uh, incredible amount of races and you can see all the stickers everywhere, been to Monaco and in other places, and uh, he, he drove it a lot um, and then won a couple of cups with it too. This car was completed about 12 years ago and then uh, he drove it about 100,000 kilometers in racing conditions. Then he had to rebuild the engine, which is uh, considered normal in this kind of conditions. 
He went to uh, Monaco twice with it. Ugye Monte Carlo is held uh, like in the middle of the winter. So uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty harsh on a person who drives it and also uh, on the vehicle as well. This is a 1600 cc engine. And even when the car was new, you were able to buy a kit to make it to a race car. So basically you bought your normal Renault in the uh, dealership and then you bought that racing kit for it. And it was good enough to drive to work. And then when you were a weekend warrior, you can just go out to the racetrack and actually just uh, drive it around as a race car. And then when you were done with the race, you were able to actually drive it home. So it was not uh, really a uh, souped up race car where you, can't, where you have to have a trailer and take it. You can actually drove it to the racetrack. So if you did this modification, it's end up being around 140 uh, horsepower. This is Tomás is a 2.3 S a bar. This car was made in 1964 and it was uh, uh, basically a, a nickname, the poor man's Ferrari at the time when it was new. I found this car in Hungary and like many times when people trying to restore cars, they really just took it apart and then they lost most of it. So the inside was all missing and there were several missing parts. Uh, so I just decided to make it to a race car. Therefore, I'm not going to ruin a nice original one. So we built it to our taste and went to many races like this uh, last Monte Carlo rally. And then we, this is where we won the uh, category second and then 11th place overall. Tomás is very proud of this because uh, this was the first time any Hungarians won anything in Monte Carlo. This is a six cylinder engine, it's a 2300 cc. It actually has three carburetors, not two like normally it would have, and it's proved fairly reliable. They have designed this engine in the late 50s. And there were several different versions of it. There was a four-cylinder version. They just left two cylinders off, and that migrated over to the Polski Fiat, which the uh, which was uh, manufactured in Poland. And this engine was actually used in many other Fiat products of the time. This engine has uh, four main bearings, so it's like a uh, with, with push rods. It's a really old-fashioned uh, Italian Fiat engine. It has a lot of torque. It doesn't really like to. Uh, rev too high so it's like a good old-fashioned reliable engine and this one is the most special car of all for citroen collectors if i would tell them we're looking at a birotor they would tell me like yeah i'm i'm saying something weird and it's not true and i don't know what i'm looking at but uh yeah this thing is a 1973 citroen ds and this one is a birotor edition um, back in the 70s, everybody thought that the Wankel engine going to be the next good thing or next big thing. So they uh, they started to, uh, uh, the big manufacturers, they were started to buying the, the license to it. And practically only Mazda succeeded in large number production. But uh, Citroen also got in it and they start manufacturing this car. So they built an engine factory in Belgium, and they call it the Komotor, and then uh, they manufactured engines for NSU as well, to RO80, and then that had a, a two-disc engine, and then they had the Prince, which had one-disc engine, and they also put that uh, one rotor disc uh, into the Citroen M35, and the uh, two discs to uh, these kind of cars, but it looked a little bit different than the uh, what the NSU got. And then came the uh, oil crisis. So NSU got bought up by Audi, and Audi decided that they don't really want to deal with this uh, Wankel engine. So Citroen left alone, and then Citroen stopped making these engines on its own. So uh, they actually recalled all these cars, and they destroyed all the engines so they wouldn't have to provide uh, spare parts in the future. So very few of these cars actually survived and then uh, uh, the engines are basically so scarce that you can't find any parts for it. Those cars who didn't get destroyed by Citroen got destroyed by the owners because the car was a pretty fast car and people couldn't just uh, refrain from using all the power what it was given so basically they ran, ran them to death.
So Citroën started a campaign to uh, purchase back all the vehicles and if the engine was broken it was even better, it was not broken, they actually destroyed it at Citroën. So there was very few survivals again. So this one was found in a barn and of course the engine was broken in it. So they found a guy uh, who had parts for these cars so it took a long time to, uh, to actually uh, fix it up and make it work again. Tomas was able to find uh, NSU uh, brand specialist who who saved some of these parts and then he was able to uh, uh, help him fix up this engine. So now it actually runs. So it took a good two years for him. The rest of the car was really nice, so it only needed polishing and then uh, some uh, general repairs. And then now it's finally working. So this is the uh, holy grail for Citroen collectors, one of these, and it actually runs. When he bought the car, he never in a million years thought it's actually ever going to run. So he's very proud of the fact that uh, he was able to uh, source all the parts and then put it all together and then finally working. So I asked him to show us like what's going on here. So like uh, it's a very different uh, setup than a regular piston powered car. He's saying the whole engine is smaller than the battery and it makes 107 horsepower. You can see in the middle, that's the heart of it, the two rotors. And then uh, they are the rotating discs. And then uh, there is a, a couple of parts like a water pump. There's a half automatic transmission mated to the engine. And then uh, there is a two barrel Solax carburetor. You have a distributor and the distributor had an electronic ignition part and that part was missing. So he had to source some sort of Bosch unit and make it work with all these things because uh, a part of the ignition system just uh, was, didn't, wasn't on the car for some reason. He's saying the NSU Birotor and the Porsche Turbo use the same kind of ignition electronics, so he was able to uh, source it from Porsche and actually modify it for this car, so now it's working fine. The alternator drive has an interesting setup because they actually use the long shaft to drive the alternator bits, and the alternator is way on the side. I'm not sure how much can you see it, but it's at the very far end of the engine, and it's run by well, it looks like a drive shaft right next to the right next to the starter motor. Uh, I don't know if how much you can see from it, but uh, there it is. It got its suspension from a Citroen CX, which is a later car, but the uh, the, the suspension was already actually being uh, designed and it was ready for use. So the disc, the rotor disc, are not in the middle of the car. It actually uh, has the uh, the rotors, the brake rotors, at the normal position where where normally the cars have, and the actually a little wider, the front end is a little bit wider than the rear to make it more stable. There's a lot of difference between a normal Citroen DS and then this one. So there's a lot of special parts what they put on, like the end of the, uh, the bumpers are different, and then there's a lot of other parts all around the car which they modified for this particular Birotor edition. Since the engine runs so much harder than a normal car, they had to protect the exhaust with a wire mesh. So when the car uh, lowers itself down with the hydraulic suspension, make sure it wouldn't catch the uh, dry grass on fire underneath it. So that exhaust is, is a super hot exhaust. I asked Tomas to let's start the damn thing so we can hear how it sound like. Uh, it's not a regular car for sure.
So I can't say it was a really exciting V8 engine sound, but it's definitely a very rare engine sound. So I asked Tomasz, like, how many of these cars actually runs in the world? So he's saying it's most likely less than 10, but left from uh, the 847 what was manufactured. I like strange uh, things, everything automotive or flies or floats, and that was definitely a, a treat for me. So thank you, Tomasz, to, uh, to show us this and then be able to hear this. I don't know how the spare tire not exploding in the heat <laughs> under the hood. But yes, that's a French design for sure. So I think we can understand why this car is his most favorite in the whole collection. Next we see two very large European cars. Uh, these are actually Peugeots. But uh, I don't think I can ever see any. What, what are these? Tomasz saying that uh, this was uh, came from his childhood. So they actually owned one of these when he was a, when he was a young man. And then he was feeling very lucky that he actually found two of them. And then the first one was this one. And and uh, he fixed it up and now it runs really well. Um, he's very, very comfortable. So he actually had to stop using it because uh, he was driving it one year and put 8,000 kilometers in it without even thinking about it. It's just you sit in and it's comfortable and it goes. And, and uh, so you have to be careful not to use it up. The other one came from someone who heard that he has a 604 already. And uh, the, it was belonged to an old man in Scandinavia, and uh, he was able to buy it from the widow. The widow actually seek him out because they knew that uh, he has another 604. So then they were really happy that he actually ended up uh, in Hungary because it was an expat from Hungary who owned this car, and this car never been restored or rebuilt. So it's a completely uh, original vehicle. Well, let's look at the engine. How does it look like? I'm saying it's a totally, uh, like I said, it's a totally original, untouched car. It has the original paint in the engine compartment with all the original stickers on it. So it's really interesting to see how did it look like. And uh, ask him what kind of engine that is. So he's saying it's a V6 engine. It's the PRV, um, basically designed around the mid 70s. It's the Peugeot uh, Renault Volvo engine. So they put that in the uh, Peugeot 604, 604s, the uh, 504 coupes. Most of the Volvos had that same engine. The Renault 30 had it. And uh, I was asking, is that the one that made it into the DeLorean too? And he said, yes. Also the 310 Alpine, which actually sits next to this car. And all of these uh, cars uh, had these engines. So like, wait a minute, what is that red car next to it? So he's saying that was uh, uh, Renault's answer to the uh, Porsches. So this is called the uh, 310 Alpine. It's mostly made out of fiberglass and has the engine on the back. And it was a proper race car, but what Renault built for uh, racing purposes. There is one actually made it into Hungary and there was a Hungarian race car driver who owned one. And uh, that was pretty much uh, Renault's answer to the, uh, to the Porsches. They have manufactured these cars all the way into the 90s. First with one turbos, then uh, dual turbos. The 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s, you were able to see these on the uh, on the uh, race tracks, mostly on the uh, rally competitions. This Volvo belongs to one of their customers. They actually restored this car, and it used to belong to the uh, Hungarian government, most likely to the uh, Hungarian army. But uh, now it just sits here. It's in great condition now. When I was a kid, I always liked cars with fins. And the first time I ever seen one of these, it was in a backyard and it was uh, it was totally rotten away, but I was able to see the fins on it and I was totally mesmerized. Since then, I really, really like this car. I like the whole way it looks like, but I seen it in uh, movies in uh, Africa and other places. Um, yeah, this is, this is really nice. You can see the roof rack holders where you can like, click in the roof rack on it. And it's just a gorgeous car. I never actually bought one. It's not all that expensive, but it's very usable. Oh, there is an Austrian uh, freeway sticker on it. So you can see this car is absolutely, this classic car is actually absolutely drivable. And it takes you everywhere. And it will not break down. It's called the Peugeot 404 with this nice uh, tits looking uh, headlights. I, I really like this car. I love it.
So this is a Tomash car. It's a Peugeot 404 from 1965. It's a super deluxe. That's why it had this extra uh, fog lights on it with those little tits. And then uh, it ca came with more chrome than a normal vehicle. It has a 1.6 liter engine with a 68 horsepower. And they took it a lot on all kind of road trips, and it's just a very, very reliable vehicle. So I see another car which uh, looks somewhat similar, but not exactly the same. What is that? Tomás is saying that's a Pininfarina coupe. It made in uh, very low numbers, so it was actually more expensive than an E-Type of the time. And then the way they made it, they uh, actually made the frame and the engine and the drivetrain in the Peugeot factory, then they shipped it over to the Pininfarina factory, then the factory actually uh, finished off the body, and then they sent it back to the factory to totally finish it off. So that was, uh, that was a lot of expense involved in this. So this car has beautiful lines. And then uh, the specialty of this very vehicle is that uh, only the cars were sold in Holland have the, uh, the sunroof on it. So there was a small little factory in Holland who did this modification with the request of the uh, dealers uh, of uh, Holland. So if you see a car, a, a 404 coupe with a, with a cutout, that means it was sold in Holland when it was new. Well, let's look at the engine. So it has a fuel injection, it's 78 horsepower, and you can see that uh, it's a direct fuel injection. Um, if you look down at the bottom, you can see the injection pump made by uh, Cougar Fisher right there. There is an other evidence of this uh, coach built system. So the normal, the, the, the pin in Farina put on the uh, the fenders and the back part and the coupe part, but the uh, original car had a hood open the other way, and you can see the hood latch, uh, the part of the hood latch is still existing on the front. That's that's for a normal car. Finally, we can see a British car. This beauty is a customer's car, and it's a Morris 10. Uh, you were able to see these cars a lot in England. It was uh, it was very popular. There's not that many left of it. It's got a suicide door on the front, a very nice uh, metal uh, sunroof on the top. I really like it. It's just a nice time period to have a car from. Well, let's head back to Italy. So what do we see here? Um, this one looks like an Italian car in a French car collection. So what's up with that? Tomas is saying that he has this Alfa Romeo for a about a good 20 years. Um, when he bought it, he didn't actually fix it up totally. He just uh, repainted it, uh, got a little rocker panel uh, work on it and a little body work on it. But this is a surprisingly reliable car, even though it's from Italy. And, and he went to several races and it's every time he sits in it, it just goes and goes and goes. So he likes to drive it. He's been to the historical Monte Carlo rally and many other rallies uh, where he likes to participate in. Last year, his uh, friend borrowed it and then he drove it on Monte Carlo, uh, the Monte Carlo rally because uh, his friend's car was not accepted by the uh, commission. Thanks for watching. And next weekend, I'm going to take you out. It's down to the workshop where he's working on uh, the customer's cars and some of his own cars. So that's going to be part two of this video. Thanks for watching and see you guys next Friday. Bye.